the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Sue Suido is currently Chief of the Pediatrics and Developmental Neuroscience Branch at the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Suido joined the staff of the Child Psychiatry Branch at the NIMH in 1986, where she conducted research on childhood obsessive compulsive disorder. Dr. Suido and her NIMH team were the first to identify a new subtype of pediatric OCD in which symptoms are triggered by cross-reactive antibodies produced in response to infections with group A strep. The subgroup is known by the acronym PANDAS, which stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infections. Subsequent work has revealed that cross-reactive antibodies are unique to a PANDAS subgroup and have biologic activity in the central nervous system. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Suido. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to be with you today. <clears throat> Forgive my hoarse voice, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, I'm delighted to be able to talk to so many folks across the country and possibly the globe about pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric disorders. I have no uh, financial or other conflicts of interest to declare or disclose. And I'm doing this as part of my official duties for the National Institute of Mental Health uh, within the National Institutes of Health Intramural Research Program. I want to thank my colleagues and collaborators um, across the United States. We have recently established a network of centers of excellence for uh, the diagnosis and treatment of PANS and PANDAS and have centers currently operating excuse me, in uh, Massachusetts at Mass General, Columbia, Delo University of Delaware at Nemours, University of South Florida, uh, University of Minnesota, University of Missouri, University of Arizona, and Stanford University. Additional centers are coming online in the coming months, uh, but at each of those mentioned, there are clinicians who have expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of acute onset symptomatology, uh, including that presenting in children with primary developmental disorders such as autism. Among typically developing children, about 1%, 1 in 100, will have obsessive compulsive disorder uh, symptoms that meet clinical severity and approximately 1 to 5 percent, depending on their age, will have motor and vocal tics. However, within the population of patients with autism spectrum disorder, the rate of OCD goes up to 40 to 50 percent, uh, probably because of the very close overlap between the repetitive behaviors and fixated interests that are part of the core symptoms of autism and the uh, obsessional thoughts and compulsive rituals that make up OCD. Our brain doesn't really respect the DSM diagnoses, so uh, if, if it repeats in one disorder, we call it uh, stereotypies, and in another disorder, we call it compulsions. However, we are today talking about only a fraction of those children with OCD and tics. It's been estimated that in the grade school age child, acute onset cases may make up as many as a quarter of the patients but uh, during symptoms that begin during adolescence or later are much less likely to be of an abrupt onset. And we'll talk more about the diagnostic criteria in the minute, but what you can see is that within the, the group of acute onset neuropsychiatric syndromes, there are cases in which the, an infectious trigger can be identified. We used to call that P PITANS for pediatric infection triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders and then non-infectious triggers such as poisons or tumors or child abuse and other things. And then within the infectious triggers, it isn't just group A strep or the PANDAS cohort, but other microbes as well. And even though I have Lyme on this slide, uh, we now believe that Lyme is a very rare 
uh, cause of PANS if it presents that way at all. And if you think about that, that makes sense because the symptoms of chronic Lyme come on slowly, insidiously, uh, rather than abruptly. Oh, sorry. The prototype disorder for post-streptococcal acute onset OCD is Sydenham chorea. And Sydenham is the neurologic manifestation of acute rheumatic fever. It is, by definition, a post-group A streptococcal illness. The group A strep infection, uh, if it lingers for at least three to five days, it sets up antibodies uh, that recognize it as foreign, but unfortunately, because of the compensity, propensity of the strep to mimic its human host, those antibodies then get mixed up and attack the host tissues. In the case of rheumatic heart disease or rheumatic carditis, they are against the muscle and valves of the heart. And in Sydenham, Korea, there's studies demonstrating that the antibodies actually recognize neurons within the basal ganglia or the gatekeeper of the brain. From excuse me, from the first descriptions by Thomas Sydenham in 1695, it's been known that emotional ability, personality change, and other psychiatric symptoms were nearly universal in patients with Sydenham chorea. During the 1980s, we discovered that obsessive compulsive symptoms are also quite frequent with somewhere between uh, two-thirds and three-quarters of children having obsessive compulsive symptoms at their first presentation and with multiple episodes that increases to 100 percent. It was those observations that led us to thinking about this, but uh, just to, to go back in time for a moment, the kinds of symptoms that had been described here in a paper in 1922 uh, it says mental symptoms can occur at any stage in the course of Sydenham chorea. And in the case number two, the child became acutely disturbed and excited. She tore at her clothes and threatened suicide. Very interesting, she refused to eat because she thought her food was, quote, doped, saying the potatoes were filled with fecal material. And their refusal to eat because of contamination fears is quite common in patients, not only with Sydenham chorea, but with pandas or pans. In case number four, she actually had hallucinations, as do about 20% of our kids. She saw mice and moving objects in her room, saw a man climbing through the window and screamed with fears. She also had to be tube fed because she thought her food was poisoned. The first case of pandas was actually an eight-year-old male who was referred to the NIH as part of our studies of Sydenham Korea because of these large flailing movements of his arms and what had been diagnosed as dysarthria and inability to speak clearly. Interestingly, his family history was positive for rheumatic fever, specifically Sydenham Korea, and also for Tourette disorder. And in this family of three boys, uh, QR's older sibling had an interesting history in that any time his tics would worsen, his mother would know to get a throat culture done because within a day or two of his tics uh, becoming more severe, he would end up with a strep, uh, strep throat. And so they learned to use his tics as a warning sign of the, the incipient strep, cultured him and treated him and his tics would improve. Well, when his younger brother developed these wild arm movements and the inability to speak, he was sent to our Sydenham Korea study where we, um, in an extensive interview, determined that he actually had quite profound obsessive compulsive symptomatology. He uh, was spending several hours each day washing his hands. He refused to swallow his saliva because he thought it was contaminated with germs from the air. He had hoarding and other obsessive compulsive symptoms. And three different neurologists here at the NIH examined him and found no chorea. And in fact, when you watched his arm movements over time, it became clear that they were done in exactly the same way each time. So it was either a complex tick or a compulsion. And the uh, diagnosis of dysarthria was actually because he wasn't swallowing his own saliva. So we did a throat culture. He, uh, which was positive here, treated him with antibiotics, and just as they worked for his brother, they worked for this young man as well, as did Tincture of Time. He 
was thought to have Sydenham Korea, but had absolutely no evidence of Korea. And that absence of Korea in the presence of the other neuropsychiatric symptomatology is the group of patients that became known as PANDAS. When we went back and looked in our drug treatment trial, uh, approximately one quarter of the patients that were being treated here at the NIMH had an ab abrupt onset. And then we went out and asked for acute onset cases. And among those, over 80% uh, had strep as their trigger. This extremely abrupt onset really differed greatly from the typical onset of obsessive compulsive disorder. And the children had a relaxing and remitting course where their symptoms would come on very severely and gradually over a period of weeks or months improve. If they didn't have enough strep infection, it would all be gone forever. If they did have another strep or infectious trigger, the symptoms would come back with the same ferocity and the same acuity. These patients were different than the larger group of children with OCD in that they um, were uh, present in very young children, ages six and a half to seven and a half, <clears throat> and boys outnumbered girls approximately three to one. The criteria that we proposed for PANDAS were presence of OCD and or a tick disorder with prepubertal onset. This very, very abrupt onset was a core and most important uh, symptom, as was the presence of neurologic abnormalities, either the tics or in 95% of our children during acute episodes, choreiform movements, which are fine piano playing movements when the child has their arms extended straight out in front of them and is standing uh, still with their arms out and their eyes closed for at least 30 seconds. The final thing was this temporal relationship between the symptom exacerbations in the group A beta hemolytic strep infections. And that temporal relationship was purposefully vague because in Sydenham, Korea, there can be a five to nine month lag between the inciting strep infection and the onset of the Korea. However, in the subsequent years since we first wrote these criteria, we've discovered that for most children, they behave as our index patient did, as QR did. And that was that if you do a throat culture at the time their symptoms are severe, throat culture is quite likely to be positive. The other unique thing about these patients is it isn't just OCD that starts out of the blue. They also have an abrupt onset of separation anxiety in about 98%, going along with behavioral regression of baby talk and tantrums. They have very significant uh, sleep disorders. So in the autistic population, this might be hard to distinguish from other causes of insomnia. But if a child has been doing well, getting to sleep within 15 to 20 minutes of bedtime and suddenly needs um, three, four, five hours and is still having restless sleep after that, then uh, one might consider that as a symptom of the pandas. Inability to concentrate, so their schoolwork will begin to deteriorate. A new onset of hyperactivity and inattentiveness. This can be on the background of ADHD, so it needs to be a significant change from their baseline. New onset of aggressiveness, rage attacks in approximately 60% of the children. Here it says eating disorder in 20%, but on the next slide I'll show you that we, when we looked more carefully, it was actually almost 50% of the children. And Dr. Miro Kovacevic, Loyola University in Chicago was the first to describe the terror-stricken look and dilated pupils or midriasis that are seen in these children. 80% um, have this hyper-alert appearance. And if you think about the fight or flight response that represents anxiety, these kids are in the flight mode uh, most of the time. I would say a hallmark or truly classic symptom of PANS pandas is the abrupt onset of urinary frequency, urgency, and new onset of uh, daytime and nighttime uh, wetting, daytime accidents and, and nighttime uh, bed wetting. We've seen it in 90% of the children. It's typically present for the first days or weeks of the illness and then will improve over time. Um, but again, particularly if it comes on in conjunction with new onset of sleep, some separation anxiety, and new increase in rituals and um, 
stuck behaviors than one might think about pandas. For children who are able to write, handwriting deteriorations uh, are quite common, as are tics and short-term memory loss. What this means in the terms of the short-term memory loss is that during the course of illness, they don't appear to be laying down new memories as easily as they did before they were ill, and it's also harder for them to learn things. So for example, multiplication tables are quite difficult. Sensory hypersensitivity or insensitivity is present in 40% of the children. Again, among children who have a primary diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, this would be an exaggeration of their uh, baseline sensory hypersensitivities. It can't just be sort of a, a bit of worsening. It would need to be either a new symptom or a very severe exacerbation of symptoms that were previously present. So you may have heard the pandas is quite is considered to be quite controversial, and in large part that is because it's so hard to make an association with strep in pandas that is truly uh, uh, causal, i.e. that that the child's symptoms are related to that strep and not just a, a coincidence. So because strep occurs in 65 to 70 percent of grade school age children during any particular school year, and most children have at least two infections during the school year, um, it's very possible to get a war an acute onset of OCD and these other behavioral problems in conjunction with the strep, but the two things have nothing to do with each other, what we call a true, true unrelated finding. <coughs> Excuse me. Compounding this is the fact that for a grade school age child, because strep is so common, a normal ASO titer is 440. So for the parents who are listening who have been concerned that their child's strep titer is 1 to 5, 560 or 1 to 640, that's actually very close to the quote normal titer. It is still a positive titer, but all that means is that the child has had a strep infection within the past few months. Unless you can catch the titer rise, you can't be sure that this infection is related to the symptomatology. And then the second point is that because positive throat cultures can happen uh, as a result of a carrier state, some clinicians have questioned whether or not, <coughs> excuse me, we have just identified a group of carriers. However, carriers are present in only about 4 to 6 percent of the population. And by definition, a strep carrier cannot have an immune response to it. They're just basically called carriers because the strep is in their throat. And they go around infecting others, but they're not actually sick with it themselves. And as a result, they can't have a strep-related immune problem because they haven't made antibodies against that strep. Much more likely is the fact that these children have an asymptomatic strep infection. And in fact, the group A strep has the uh, capacity to mutate, to change, to be less virulent, less um, symptom producing in the acute stage in order to stay in the throat and, and multiply, which is a bacteria's primary job. This uh, panel shows us uh, the problem with titers in that you're able to uh, make a connection between a high strep titer shown in the black line and a high uh, OCD symptomatology shown in the red line, but it may be completely spurious. It may just be an accidental relationship. And if you look at the non-pandas child in month four to five, uh, you see that the titer is quite high, but it's actually going down while the symptoms are coming up and the symptoms are also relatively severe. In the classic PANDAS patient, as shown in the top panel, what you see is in month one, the child has a strep. They have an abrupt rise in their OCD symptomatology. That line could, should go actually straight up. And about six weeks later, and sometimes as long as eight weeks later, then the titer rises. Again, titers are problematic not just because they can be falsely positive, but they can also be falsely negative. And Pat Cleary and his associates at the University of Minnesota have shown that 40 to 50 percent 
of strep infections are missed even if you do both the ASO and anti-strep DNAs B. So until we have a better panel of anti-strep antibody titers, I don't think it's really helpful to um, follow these clinically in our patients. As we mentioned at the very beginning, strep is not the only infection that can trigger OCD and other symptoms. And in March of 1995, the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry published our uh, five cases in which we had an acute dramatic onset of symptomatology, including obsessive compulsive disorder, in patients with not just with group A strep, but with influenza A and chickenpox. And more recently, a number of cases have been described among children who had mycoplasma infections, that's walking pneumonia, or the H1N1 flu epidemic of a few years ago uh, was associated with a, a large outbreak of PANS. So we go back to that model and we see that infectious triggers are only a portion of the causes of an acute onset neuropsychiatric symptom syndrome. Excuse me. At the present time, I would say that 95 to 99 percent of the research has been done on pandas, and that's because it's a more easily identifiable group. But with the uh, advent of the PANS pandas research and clinical collaborative, I think that we'll be able to expand our uh, findings in pandas to the bigger class of patients with PANS. Diagnosing PANS is much, much easier than it is for pandas. Uh, and the diagnostic guidelines are available at the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. Uh, that should say 2015. I apologize, it's not 2014. Um, it was online in 2014, but in print in 2015. And those criteria require just two things. The abrupt foudroyant means lightning-like, so really the child is struck down by their symptoms of either OCD or an eating disorder, plus at least two of the seven categories. And on average, our children have four or five of these seven categories, including the separation anxiety, panic, and other anxiety symptoms, emotional ability, irritability, increased aggression, the behavioral regression with uh, developmental uh, delay, urinary frequency, urgency, or secondary aneurysis, the academic difficulties that come not just from uh, memory deficits, but also difficulties with concentration and hyperactivity. And then rolled into one is those motoric symptoms of choreiform movements, tics, and the sensory symptoms. So uh, the, the third criterion for PANS is actually that all of these symptoms have to uh, not having a better explanation. So we'll get into the differential diagnosis in a minute, but even at this point it's important to remember that if your child's physician sees chorea, the diagnosis of Sydenham chorea would be more appropriate. If they should look for tumors, they should look for toxins, they need to rule out sexual or other forms of child abuse, and uh, only when a complete medical evaluation has been done should the diagnosis of PANS be given because it's just a syndrome that, which is describing a set of behavioral symptoms. In autism, individuals with autism spectrum disorder, the presentation looks remarkably similar to that in typically developing children. And I have talked at a number of autism conferences where parents have come up and and shared their stories with me of, of their child's PANS pandas, and it didn't sound like the child met any of the criteria, much less that they had at least an abrupt onset of OCD or eating disorder and two or three of the seven categories of symptomatology. And then in that, if they meet criteria for PANS, then you want to look for the strep and determine whether they also meet criteria for PANDAS. So you're going to have an abrupt onset of a very dramatic change in the child's behavior. You have to rule out other medical and psychiatric problems in, by doing a throat culture, some labs, and possibly an EEG and sleep study to get at the core of the problem. Very noteworthy is the fact that that positive throat culture is treatable. And if you remember my description of QR, 
his uh, symptoms were so severe that people thought he had Sydenham chorea, and yet a single course of antibiotics was sufficient to treat him um, and bring him back into complete symptomatic remission. If that isn't the case, if antibiotics alone are not sufficient, there are medical guidelines for treatment available at the PANDAS Physicians uh, Network website, pandasppn.org, and I'll provide that resource at the end of my talk. Most importantly is we don't let our children suffer while we wait for the immune therapies or antibiotics to work. We go ahead and start treatment to alleviate the suffering of OCD, anxiety, and other symptomatology. I want to focus in on a few of the symptoms that really help to identify these children. And food restriction is certainly one of the, the hallmarks of this illness. You remember that the two girls with Sydenham Korea both had uh, contamination fears that led them to refuse food. Some of our children have had to be hospitalized for IV fluids because they, they so restricted food and fluid intake that they became dehydrated uh, and as well as having weight, lost weight. It, in our patients with Sydenham Korea, we actually observed that the contamination fears and the food refusal comes first, and after the child has lost 10 to 15 percent of their body weight, then they begin to develop body image distortions. So if you're seeing the patient later in the course of illness, it may look more like a classic anorexia, but you really have to take that early history and find out from the child sometimes what was the source of their uh, food and fluid refusal. Most often it's going to be contamination from germs or toxins or poisons. Sometimes it's a fear of vomiting, choking, and uh, in much less commonly a fear of gaining weight. Those children who have food restriction tend to be sicker. They tend to have more physical symptoms and as well as more of the fight or flight medriasis, ticks, and the choreiform movements. We talked about how the fact that uh, most children have at least three or four of these symptoms, and in actuality, in uh, three separate patient populations here at the NIMH with Dr. Kovacevic in Hinsdale, Illinois, and with Dr. Beth Latimer in Bethesda, on average, children had five of the seven categories, and most notably, uh, the presence of somatic or body signs and symptoms, including the sleep disturbance and uresis and urinary frequency. The example of the behavioral regression, here's a picture done uh, by a child who presented with a very classic PANDAS picture and received IVIG in June of 2006. Three months later, her drawing uh, represented her true age of approximately 10, rather than the three or four that it looked like when she first presented uh, to Dr. K. You can use the dysgraphia if you have a, a school journal or a series of papers from that child. Sometimes it's helpful to reconstruct the the early episodes, some of our children have subclinical uh, problems several times before they have their, quote, big blow. Uh, that's a quote from Dr. Tanya Murphy, who was the first to really describe these micro episodes and how significant they could be in terms of handwriting deteriorations. The other interesting thing is that uh, many of the typically developing children document an unusual margin drift where they have uh, ignoring the left side. That teacher's note says, how about starting your sentences at the red, red margin? And uh, <laughs> I, when I was in Germany giving a talk, a mother brought up papers uh, that her child had done, had exactly the same pattern, and the German teacher had written exactly the same thing, how about starting your sentences over at the left side. More systematic would be use of the Ray Osteris complex figure test. This is usually done as a test of working memory. And children do have some difficulties with working memory, but in uh, the greatest difficulty is actually in the visual spatial skills required to copy accurately the Ray Osteris figure. So if a child has a cognitive capacity to do this test, it can be quite 
helpful particularly as a way of following along the course of the illness. Similarly, if they have a cognitive capacity to uh, participate in uh, neuropsychological testing for executive function, children with PANDAS will have specific deficits in response selection where the button press order is changed and the child has to simultaneously inhibit and excite uh, neuronal networks within the brain. And the pattern is quite different from that seen with non-PANDAS Tourette syndrome or ADHD. We've talked, <coughs> excuse me, we've talked probably too much about urinary symptoms today, but I do hammer this point home because it's actually so unique and specific to pandas. And in medicine, there's a word pathognomonic, which means it's just when you see it, you know, and that's what this is. When you see this, you know that the child uh, is having an acute behavioral disturbance that is neurologically based. Whether it's pans pandas or whether it's autoimmune encephalitis is not clear until you've done the appropriate medical workup, but the simultaneous onset of new urinary symptoms and be neuropsychiatric behavioral symptoms is a suggestion that you need to be looking uh, more specifically at the brain. So we've talked a bit about the differential diagnosis. Sydenham chorea is at the top of the list, but is actually quite rare, so it's unlikely that uh, a child will have this as their uh, correct diagnosis. However, here in the Washington, D.C. area, there was a mini epidemic of acute rheumatic fever about five years ago, and during that uh, rheumatic fever epidemic, we had a very large epidemic of pandas, both clinical and subclinical cases. Encephalitis, sorry, and before I leave Sydenham, I want to remind you that it's important to make the diagnosis accurately, because if the child has Sydenham chorea, that means that they have a very high chance of having rheumatic heart disease, and that's a life crippling, life ending condition. So you want to make sure that the diagnosis is made in a timely fashion and the child is started on appropriate antibiotic prophylaxis against group A strep. Encephalitis, uh, you might need to do a spinal tap and lumbar puncture or MRI uh, with specific. Uh, weighting of the images to look for inflammation. A sleep study might also be helpful because it can show specific abnormalities uh, consistent with encephalitis, or most probably an electroencephalogram EEG would be done to look for the, the hallmark signs of epileptiform discharges or uh, focal areas of slowing of brain activity. Child abuse cannot be excluded. Um, it needs to be considered in all children, particularly those with autism spectrum disorder because of their uh, problems with approach and knowing uh, strangers from non-strangers. So uh, a careful history should be done. However, once the diagnosis has been excluded, it's important to move forward and not um, make things worse for the family by continuing to harp on that. Toxins, has there been a way that the child got into the parent's medications or got access to illicit drugs? That would still be the very most common cause of an abrupt uh, behavioral deterioration. And then very rarely you'd think of find things like tumors, strokes, or other problems. So the medical workup is just basically to rule out all of those other known causes of neuropsychiatric symptomatology, and then to begin looking for strep. Do uh, adenoid and tonsil examination. If those adenoids or tonsils are large, uh, you need to make sure that the culture has been adequate to get both. Sinus infection is a very common occult or hidden cause of pandas, pans. You can also get strep in the perirectal area, so they might have a red, fiery red a ring around the anus, and if you culture that, it's going to grow out group A strep. You want to look for chorea form movements, perhaps do an echocardiogram or an EKG electrocardiogram to rule out rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, and then test with for strep. It really only uh, useful test is an adequately obtained swab and 
overnight or 48 hour culture. If you have a positive rapid strep test, that is uh, a sign that the child has a group A strep, but if the group rapid strep is negative, a culture should still be sent for overnight growth because rapid strep misses between 15 and 20 percent of infections. In some children, because it's the adenoids and the nasopharynx that's infected, you actually have to do a specific and separate nasopharyngeal culture. Lab tests, if the onset has been less than a week, you, it may be useful to check for the strep titers, but remember that 40 percent or so are going to be falsely negative. So unless insurance covers this completely, I don't think it's worth the family spending uh, money on this test. If you want to do an antibody test, uh, I would do an ANA, the test that's uh, considered to be diagnostic for lupus, because in an over half of our patients, the ANA is positive. And in combination with the CAM kinase from the Cunningham panel, a positive ANA plus a Cunningham panel uh, appeared to predict treatment response in our most recent IVIG trial. Madeline Cunningham's titers can be obtained from Molecularia labs. Again, insurance will pay for this in many of the patients, particularly because you can use it to uh, ensure that you don't have an autoimmune encephalitis at, at play. However, they should not be done in all children because they have a high uh, false positive rate, not really false positive, a high rate of positives that are not indicative of disease. And I corrected myself because we don't know why they're positive in children with autism, but it does not appear to be related to PANDAS. So uh, it may be some other processes at work and, and that research is going on now. But if your child has not had an abrupt and recent onset of PANS symptoms, then it's not helpful to get a Cunningham panel. All right, so the management of cases of PANS is quite simple. You're going to treat the source by treating and preventing infections. You're going to treat the immune system dysfunction, and you're going to treat the symptoms. So those three S's would boil down to antibiotics, steroids, IVIG, or plasmapheresis, and very importantly, uh, continued management of the behavioral symptoms through cognitive behavior therapy and possibly use of psychotropic medications. And it's really highlighted here that you have to start low and go slow. Most of us agree that you use only about 1 20th to 1 10th of the normal dose of uh, psychotropics. We know that children and adolescents with Autism spectrum disorders can be quite sensitive to medications and, importantly, to side effects of medications. Same thing is true for the child with PANS pandas. So you need to start really, really slow and taper that dose up um, quite gingerly. SSRIs are useful. There's some internet chatter saying that they're not and that the child gets worse. The child only gets worse if you start too high a dose of an activating SSRI. Otherwise, they can be quite useful, but unfortunately can take 8 to 12 weeks to uh, show maximum benefit. In the short term, you might want to use anxiolytics. Benzodiazepines are of particular interest because they're the drug of choice for treatment of the sleep abnormalities that are seen in uh, patients with PANDAS. A melatonin or a stronger sedative agent to help that child get sleep because the more nights that the child goes without sleep, the more behavioral problems are going to be coming just from the sleep deprivation. So it's important to get on top of that early. I put in a section here on classroom management. Most children with autism spectrum disorder have uh, plans in place for their education and during uh, periods of illness with PANS and PANDAS, those plans may need to be modified because they, the child may have a marked change in their levels of physical violence and aggression, might have uh, urination so frequent and so urgent that they begin to wet themselves again when they haven't had accidents for a number of years and have been toilet trained previously. Self-destructive acts can be quite uh, concerning and sometimes difficult to control 
and uh, because the child is easily fatigued, it's possible that they're going to need to have a shortened class day or even be home uh, schooled during the period of illness. Beha the effective behavior modification that we do every single day to help our uh, individuals with autism spectrum disorders reach maximal um, productivity are also appropriate for the child with PANS PANDAS. And they're just the basics of setting limits, reinforcing the desired behaviors, and uh, ignoring negative behaviors, and in some cases punishing unwanted behaviors by re removing the reinforcements or obstructing dangerous behaviors. However, it is important to remember that this child is not in control of their uh, behavior during this period of time, so any discipline should be uh, directed at the specific unwanted and dangerous behavior rather than at the child as a whole. And because of that, you need to choose the battles worth fighting and let some other ones go. And over the long term, what becomes most important is to accommodate the child's new level of dysfunction without reinforcing the problem behaviors. And what I mean by this is don't give in to the OCD, give in to the child's need for some additional uh, care and concern. For example, um, we had a young boy who had contamination fears, and when he first presented to our clinic, his mother was washing the floor of the kitchen five times a day so that he could go on a clean floor from his room to the kitchen and eat at a table at a time when his brothers, who were source of contamination, were nowhere in the vicinity, and then he'd go back to his room. Well, by the time we saw him a few weeks later, that reinforcement had become so severe he was no longer able to leave his bed because the entire house had begun become contaminated. So working with a, an experienced behavior therapist is extremely important, even early in the illness before the child is ready for treatment, just to keep the parents um, in control. Specific symptoms, all of these are addressed in uh, the on the PANDAS Physicians Network website, as well as in some guidelines that should be coming out in the next few weeks in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. Uh, my colleagues and I have written three papers on use of antibiotics, on use of immunosuppressive therapies, and on use of psychiatric uh, medications and behavioral measures in OCD and PANS, PANDAS. So uh, these are sort of longer term suggestions, and that would uh, include the fact that some of the children have ongoing deficits, particularly in visual spatial skills. Maybe those things had previously been a strength and they've come down to the normal range, or perhaps they were already in the normal range and are now going to be uh, identified as an area of weakness. And on an ongoing basis, if there's any evidence that strep was the trigger of the first episode, it's important to minimize exposure to the strep for at least a year after the child's recovered. And so uh, enlist the aid of the school nurse to report home there's been a strep case in the classroom or uh, in the child's close contacts. This book is just out, just published. Um, by uh, Patricia Rice Noren with and Margot Tienemann from uh, Stanford University contributed the psychiatric components of the book, and it talks goes over many of these suggestions that I've given you as well as uh, much more depth. And you might want to get a copy of it to share with the child's teacher. Here are the resources that I've mentioned during our time together. I'll keep them up during the Q&A period. Uh, includes that Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology. There was a special issue on PANS PANDAS in January, February of 2015. It included 11 articles on PANS. Uh, most useful to you will be the first one, the diagnostic guidelines and suggestions for the medical evaluation of the children. Our, uh, my team and I are willing to answer individual questions about the general topic. Obviously, we can't give medical advice um, over the internet, but we would be happy to help um, guide you to therapists or individuals who have experience with PANS, PANDAS, if you're needing 
an evaluation and treatment for your child. Clinicians can go to the PANDAS Physicians Network and, and get their own um, summary of our guidelines. For parents, I think that the PANDAS Network is more useful, and that's available at pandasnetwork.org. And in addition, the International OCD Foundation, IOCDF.org, has a large uh, variety of materials available, not just for the diagnosis and treatment of PANS PANDAS, but also for how to manage OCD, including obsessive compulsive disorder in individuals with autism. And with that, Denise, I, can I turn it back to you so that you can... Um, Yes, I, we have a lot of questions. Um, as Dr. Sweeto noted, we can't ask or pose any sort of medical questions over the internet because it would be uh, difficult for her to answer those without having actually seen a patient. But we have many, many questions here. So I will start reading them and uh, we'll see how far we can get. One of the first things and a question that was asked repeatedly was about when a strep test comes back negative, but the child is still displaying symptoms, what does that mean? So if they if they do an active stress strep test and they still have symptoms, but they're you know when they do a throat culture, what, what's a parent to think at that point? So so pan, a strep culture done correctly is definitive. So if it's truly negative, then strep is not the cause of this exacerbation and that's good news because you don't have to treat the strep infection. I said one is done well and that really requires that the that the throat swab reach the oropharynx right up behind the uvula, the ha hanging down thing, <laughs> and get up into that nasopharynx. It's up in the back of the throat uh, I was taught that if you didn't worry about your shoes because you really thought the child was going to throw up on you, you hadn't done an adequate throat culture. And you also need to make sure that that culturette has touched the tonsils on the back side, not just the front. So because children with autism tend to be hard to examine, hard to manage, and sometimes they have difficulty cooperating with the physician, the most likely um, cause of a negative culture in a child with autism is actually that the throat culture didn't get to the right place. Sometimes you can increase your yield by doing a, a rectal culture and you would end up with some uh, strep that has passed through the GI system and is uh, present in the perianal region. In other cases you actually just have to treat empirically um, with a, a single course of antibiotics. However, if you're confident that the culture was done properly and it's truly negative, then you can rule out PAN does and just focus on PANs. And there the differential includes uh, other infections like viruses, which don't require antibiotic treatment, but which might benefit from other management, and uh, the encephalitides and the other things we talked about. So if no strep is present, the diagnosis is PANs. If the child has an abrupt onset of OCD and at least two of the seven comorbid symptoms. Great, that's great. That really helps. Um, the next question is about uh, just talking about this with physicians. So, in the medical community, what is your sense of how the pediatric community and the sort of general practitioner community has been educated about this issue and how parents or you know fellow colleagues can bring it up? Yes, so I just got back from Arizona where they launched the uh, University of Arizona Center of Excellence and one of their primary um, objectives is to educate the physicians and clinicians in the state of Arizona and other s sites are doing it similarly. It requires quite a bit of work on the part of the parents and, and the parent advocacy groups to get the word out because unfortunately PANDAS is still considered to be controversial. Uh, I know of an upcoming editorial that once again declares that or asks the question about whether it even exists. So it tends to be difficult but the American Academy of Pediatrics has pledged to uh, review all the science and it's quite plentiful over the last 30 years and really um, issue a policy statement, which I understand they're going to say that it's quite definitive that strep can cause neuropsychiatric symptomatology. In the meantime, 
my best advice would be to uh, seek the resources of the IOCDF or the PANDAS network. They have a lot of clinicians who, excuse me, they have a list of clinicians who are experienced and comfortable treating PANS PANDAS, including individuals with expertise in um, developmental disabilities. So I think it's important to get to a clinician who's willing to listen. Uh, if they're willing to listen and just have questions, then send them to the OCD research at mail.nih.gov or to the PANDAS Physicians Network at pandasppn.org. Okay, great. Uh, I'm getting a lot of questions about lifespan. So let's start at the beginning. Um, some people are asking, can, can it be from birth? Can they have... Is, have you seen situations where you would estimate that they actually had pandas from birth? No. It, um, first of all, before the age of two, the immune system doesn't respond to strep in a way that gives you rheumatic fever, Sydenham, Korea, or is likely to give you pandas. We actually spent over a decade looking for uh, a pandas variant of autism, thinking that maybe some regressive autism was related to this, could be a, a sequelae of a strep infection or other infectious process, did not find it. So I think uh, present from birth is extremely unlikely. The peak age at onset is between six and eight years of age. Uh, the children may have multiple episodes before they become teenagers, and then it's kind of like Tourette syndrome. There's three directions it can go. It can get worse, it can stay the same, or it can get better uh, as the child goes through puberty. For our children with PANS pandas who receive an early and accurate diagnosis and get treated appropriately for infections as well as, as their symptoms, uh, the outcome is quite good, and this does not have to be a long-standing chronic problem. So reflecting back on what you were saying about adults, so you talked about the three different paths. So there are individuals who would be, who perhaps were diagnosed when they were prepubescent, but once they're in adulthood, could they still be diagnosed with this? Yes, although at that point it's not clear that it would matter. So this, remember this was described as a subgroup of children with OCD or tic disorders. So when those uh, children grow up and become young adults or even middle-aged adults, what you would see is fairly classic obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and it would respond the same to SSRIs and cognitive behavior therapy as if you didn't uh, have an abrupt onset and, and didn't fit criteria for PANS PANDAS. So use of SSRIs, use of anti-anxiolytic medications, cognitive behavior therapy are still the treatments of choice. Okay. The next question is about brain imaging studies. So have brain imaging studies been done in PANS and PANDAS? And if yes, what do those look like? So we, there's just a small number of studies. Uh, the MRI study showed that there was enlargement of the basal ganglia structures, specifically the caudate, patemen, and globus pallidus, and that would go along with inflammation, where you have swelling as a, a result of the inflammation. A uh, more definitive study was done by Harry Shigani and his colleagues at the Wayne State University using PET or positron emission tomography and a, a marker that is used to recognize activated microglia, again, a sign of active inflammation within the brain. And in that study, actually all patients with Tourette syndrome had some increased activity in the basal ganglia, but those with pandas had specific abnormalities on the lentiform nucleus. And interestingly and quite importantly, those abnormalities uh, disappeared when the child was successfully treated with intravenous immunoglobulin. Okay. The next one is related to genetics. They're asking if you're seeing genetic predisposition or if it runs in families. Has anything been identified in that vein? So we're just beginning the genetics work uh, by with sample collection. And uh, to this point, the only reports are a few family studies in which the, there was an increased uh, rate of 
OCD and tick disorders among first degree relatives, and an increased rate of rheumatic fever and particularly Sydenham chorea among grandparents. So we've hypothesized that it's sort of a dual genetic vulnerability, first to the OCD ticks, and secondly to this post-infectious um, autoimmune phenomenon that we know is rheumatic fever. Okay, so I know that we can't give any kind of specific medical advice, but what antibiotics are commonly used to address pans and pandas? So the the good news is that the antibiotics that are best uh, most effective against strep are uh, those that all of the other bacteria already have resistance to. So treatment of a child with pans pandas with antibiotics, even if it requires long term uh, prophylaxis, is done with penicillin uh, or amoxicillin if it's too hard to give the penicillin exactly as prescribed. I am penicillin um, in an intramuscular injection. They're fairly painful, so they're not used much at all in the United States, but they're being used in Italy with remarkable success. Dr. Falcini describes over 80% of pandas pans patients becoming uh, asymptomatic within a year of I am penicillin. For children who are resistant, excuse me, not resistant, who are allergic to the penicillins, uh, they could use cephalosporins or azithromycin, erythromycin. The problem with azithromycin and all of the erythromycin family is that strep can be resistant to those particular kinds of antibiotics. Okay, great. Um, a couple more questions. We're almost out of time. But I've got a parent asking about the use of IVIG. So how is it determined when IVIG would be used versus antibiotics? I think you did touch on this, but could you review that? Yeah, in fact, let's go back up to that slide. Oops. So treat the immune system dysfunction. Uh, this is the third leg of the stool for medical management, and I. IVIG, IVIG, or intravenous immunoglobulin is a useful um, treatment for children whose symptoms are severe enough that they have, if they've been getting to school every day, they're not getting to school now, or they have significant impairments in at least two areas of functioning, home, school, and with peers. So again, it has to be a change from their baseline. It has to be significant and impairing. First-line therapy is actually probably use uh, for milder cases would be use of a milder immunomodulatory agent like ibuprofen or naproxen, one of the NSAIDs. Then the next line would be use of a steroid burst, either as a short-term burst or a longer course of oral steroids. Then for the more severe cases, you'd move to IVIG and the most severely impaired, those who have life-threatening behaviors, those with uh, eating restrictions sufficient to uh, cause dehydration and the like, plasma phoresis might be consideration. And the use of those treatments is actually spelled out at the PANDAS Physician Network website. So that one right there, pandaspppn.org.